All right. The very last testimony came in yesterday, and believe it or not, Melly's best friend exposed him. It was all by accident. The prosecutor's questions were not what he was prepared for, and this might just be what gets Melly that guilty verdict. Here's what's up. Back in October 2018, things went nuts with YNW Melly and his crew. They were just hanging out at a recording studio, having a blast, not knowing something seriously tragic stuff was about to hit them. After leaving the studio, things got real dark. YNW Juvie and YNW Sack Chaser got shot and lost their lives. It's a total shock to everyone. YNW Portland had to deal with the aftermath, rushing their lifeless bodies to a nearby hospital, claiming they were hit in the drive-by shooting in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. As you know how it is, the truth always comes out. The authorities didn't take it lightly and slammed them with the first-degree murder charges for Sack and Juvie. Turned into a crazy legal mess they could not ignore. Then on February 13th, 2019, BAM! Throughout the whole legal drama, Melly kept saying he was in sticking to a not guilty plea. It was the start of a wild journey toward justice, full of uncertainty and the quest to find out what really went down. After what seemed like an eternity, YNW Melly's trial finally started a little bit over a month ago. The state took a staggering five years to build their case, and now everything is unfolding in the courtroom. The stakes are real high as Melly's future hangs in the balance, and the state's going all out, even seeking the death penalty for Melly, making it very clear that they viewed these kind of crimes as incredibly grave. Already at the start of the trial, we saw one of the biggest pieces of evidence in this whole thing, surveillance footage. The video clearly shows Melly, Bordlett, and the victims all together in a car when it was supposed to go down. And if that wasn't enough, the phone data, blood splatter analysis, and bullet casing was found in the vehicle just piled onto the evidence for the prosecution. It was a bit rocky when audio recordings of YNW Bordlett talking to a detective contradicted the whole drive-by story. The detective doubted the whole deal after he noticed some contradiction with the location. Then came came the crime scene investigators who talked about how they searched that car used in the supposed drive-by, but the defense was all over the evidence collection, questioning the visibility of fingerprints and why they didn't test all items for DNA. One good thing for Melly was that an investigator messed up handling some of this evidence, raising some serious doubts and questions about how legit other findings were. However, with all this crazy stuff going on, the absence of the murder weapon is probably perhaps Melly's strongest card that they can play. This was his strongest defense and best attempt at convincing in the jury that there was no solid proof in this case. Him and his team were playing it cool right off the bat, knowing the lack of concrete evidence will work in their favor. The first witness called up to testify was a woman named Felicia Holmes. She's a nurse who got dragged into this mess because her daughter was dating YNW Melly at the time of the deadly incident. The defense tried to twist her statements up, saying that she lied to the authorities, but they couldn't get a mistrial out of it. The state bringing up Felicia and her sticking on Melly's side was a very clear win for Melly's defense. She was 100% on Melly's side. She really hated the state for what they did to her, but that was only the beginning. The second week of the trial was full of up and downs. Drama and tension were going through the roof, and everyone was pretty much on the edge of their seats. So this FBI agent, Brendan Collins, stole the spotlight, talking about cell phone evidence. He analyzed two phones connected to Melly and one of the victims. The prosecution claimed that the data from those phones put Melly super close to the victims right before the tragic incident. But the defense had a whole different story to tell. They started raising eyebrows about the accuracy of the location data and even questioned if Melly was the only one using that phone. And they didn't stop there either. They also went after the DNA analysis. The prosecution brought up DNA evidence saying it proved Melly was inside the car during the shootings. But the defense was on point. They pointed out that Melly's DNA didn't match other stuff they examined, poking some holes in the idea of him being directly involved in this crime altogether. Guess what? The whole thing about Melly's affiliation with the Bloods came in too. The prosecution tried to make him look tied to the G-Shine Bloods gang, showing social media posts, videos, and references to the gang in his songs. They wanted to prove a connection, but the defense was trying to shut that down, saying it's more like an online persona, not for real. In fact, the judge ruled out the prosecutor's attempt to throw additional charges at Melly, as it didn't make an attempt to push this double homicide as a gang-related hit. The third week of the trial kicked off with this sharp analyst taking the Stand, and that's when Jaws started dropping. They managed to reconstruct this whole thing, and what they found out was mind blowing. You won't believe it, man. During YNW Juvie's postpartum checkup, they found this wild injury on his left cheek with tiny gunshot residue marks. And then this shooting expert came in explaining how they traced the shot's origin and path. The big revelation was that those shots didn't come from some passing car. They were fired from the back seat on the driver's side. An important point in this trial was the fact that Bortland talked to the cops on the night when Sack and Juvie were murked. He gave them the statement that was very shady and definitely not something that he and Melly were hoping for. 
let's just say he choked when it was time to forge a good alibi. I kind of think I know what happened because I got information that something else happened on the east side of the city in Pembroke Parks, but, you know, which is, sounds similar to your thing, but you need, you need to tell us, you need to be straight up with us. Moreland was talking about that crazy night, claiming they were victims of a drive-by shooting after leaving the studio. But, you know, the investigators didn't buy it all and started poking some holes in their story, making them wonder if they really were telling the truth. You can totally hear it in Moreland's voice. He's all nervous during that chat with the cops. They ain't buying some of his claims and started grilling him about the location of that supposed shooting, trying to get to the bottom of it. The cops tried to dig into motives and conflicts. Moreland got all vague and evasive. He mentioned some social media drama and beef with some people, but he wasn't giving them straight answers. The biggest slip up Portland made was saying he didn't have a phone on him. That's when the cops really started scratching their heads. You're talking about social media stuff, but you don't even use a phone? Wait a minute. Portland wasn't exactly playing nice with the boys in blue either. To top all that, he was straight up lying. His story kept changing, which just made the investigators more frustrated with him. They made it very clear that their main priority is to solve the murder of his friends, and all the other legal stuff is all secondary. They begged him to be honest with them, but he just kept avoiding their questions, making their job and lives a pain. Recording paints a messy and suspicious picture. Borland was acting all sneaky, and his answers were all over the place, making the cops wonder what's really going on here. That's probably going to come back and bite him when his trial starts later this year. No doubt about it. Getting back to the courtroom and the latest buzz in Melly's trial, recently all eyes were on the phones and where they were during the shooting. Detective Mark Moretti was in the spotlight breaking down the case in detail. Prosecution wanted to link Melly to the car where the crime supposedly went down and they had some new info to back it up. But there is a catch. The accuracy of those phone tower records are in question. People are wondering if they could really pinpoint Melly's exact location when he supposedly used that phone. You know what? The defense jumped on that, going all out to challenge the credibility of the data. Detective Moretti spilled the beans on where Melly and his crew's phones were at the time. They looked into how close the phone were to the shell casings and other crucial evidence, and all those call records played a big role in the whole story. But guess whose name popped up in the combo along the way? It was none other than your boy, Ray Bag. I raised some eyebrows about his involvement with Melly right before and after the murders, and then Sack's producer, Trayvon Glass, spilled some beans too, adding more layers to this unfolding drama. Sack Chaser's producer spilled some juicy stuff from the studio's surveillance tapes. They caught Melly, the victims, Ray Bang, and a bunch of other dudes piling into two cars. Cars, a Jeep Compass, and a red Mitsubishi. Prosecution was all over Fredo, wanting him to testify, but that dude refused to show up, sticking to that Fifth Amendment plea. So after the studio session, Glass and his crew rolled over to Melly's place and then swung by Fredo's spot to mourn their friend's loss. But here's the crazy part. Glass noticed something a little weird. Melly had changed his clothes after that recording session earlier that night. Was Melly wearing the same clothes or different clothes than when you saw him at the studio? It was a, a new bit. Nah, he wasn't. Nah, he wasn't. You guys. Wasn't wearing the same clothes. Okay. Do you recall what he was wearing? Just had on some shorts. Okay. But when they asked Glask about what went down at Fredo's, he played it all cool, keeping tight-lipped and not giving away any important details. He just said it was overwhelming grief that kept him quiet. But you know how it goes. One little thing got slipped out, and that was that Melly changed his clothes from the time that they left the studio until they met up again later. The prosecutor pounced all over that info. Everyone in that courtroom had this one big question on their minds. Why the hell did Melly and Borland change their clothes and cruise around for like 40 minutes instead of just rushing over to the hospital to check on their injured friends? Doesn't make any sense, man. Innocent folks wouldn't act like that. Nobody could wrap their heads about what was going on, and it left everyone feeling uncertain and filled with doubt. Their motives were all over the place and confusing as hell. But whatever they were up to that night is definitely looking hella suspicious, and their story ain't added up much. Aside from the text between Melly and Fredo Bank, the amount of communication between Melly and others was off the charts. They threw so many messages in court, and it totally changed the game for Melly's trial. 
prosecution was dead set on showing the jury how everything connects and spilling the truth. You won't believe it, but there's some serious family drama adding fuel to this legal fire. It's like a whole extra layer of intensity. We got a glimpse of the real deal behind Melly and his mom's crazy relationship. Juvie's sister came in hot with her threats, even leading to a bodyguard being hired by Melly's mom. Some of these messages are super cryptic, leaving us wondering if Melly really did something unthinkable. Melly straight up said he's evil, like some kind of monster who just wants to be left alone. And he told everyone to go themselves. That's heavy stuff right there. And you definitely don't want the jury seeing that. Those moments are going to stick with those people, no doubt about it. This whole situation is just adding more fuel to the fire, and it's not helping Melly's case at all. As the trial went along, we got a little peek into some real conflicts within the YNW crew that had Melly all worked up. One thing that stood out was his craving for recognition and payment for his creative genius. The messages they showed in court painted a pretty scary and unresolved picture of what was going on between Melly, Sack Chaser, and the rest of the YNW crew. It was like a power struggle, you know? A Sack and Juvie trying to be the CEOs of YNW, while Melly was the face of the brand. Their egos and visions were clashing. You could feel that the underlying animosity between the three of them. Money was a big issue too, creating a divide between Melly and Sack. When you read through those texts, you could see that they had disputes about cash and cast shadows over their once close relationship. And then there were this creative problems too. Melly didn't fully back Sack's artistic endeavors, while Sack claimed he played a huge role in shaping Melly's sound, and even more drama to this mix. Sack felt overshadowed by Melly's success, even though he was the one of the founding members of the YNW crew. He also had this weird feeling like a premonition or something that something bad was going to go down. But here's the real head scratcher. On August 30th of 2018, Melly cryptically tells Sack he can kill her with this it is what it is attitude, hinting at some soul selling deal that got everyone raising their eyebrows and scratching their noggins. With all these revelations, you can't help but wonder what the hell is really going on. After all those messages were presented in court, it's very clear that they themselves had trouble understanding their issues with each other. But one thing's for sure, this was some serious bad Bad blood between the Y&W crew. Amidst all this craziness and uncertainty, those messages are becoming like gold in the trial. It might just turn this seemingly motiveless case into something way bigger than we thought. And get this, Melly's manager hopped in on an interview and added even more drama to the mix. Jameson Francois, aka 100K Track, his manager, steps up and shares his whole take on this mess. He's super sure of himself, saying they messed up big time by accusing Melly of this murder. The track's standing firm, convinced that the rapper Melly is innocent, and he's got some inside info to back up his beliefs. But man, even with all that confidence, Track himself can't fully piece together what went down on that fateful night. He's not even sure if they were at Melly's place or Fredo's after Sack and Juvie's tragic incident. Or Fredo house, honestly, because as it was so long ago, but I remember his family was at his house, went to his house too, so it was like a little bit, everybody was a little bit in different places and things like that. I don't remember exactly where I met him, but because I did go to both house, I went, so. In this wild case, Track's revelations are making things even more complex. His words echo through the courtroom, making us wonder if there's way more to the story than we initially thought. But just a few days ago, we saw the very last witness take the stand. It was one of Melly's pals who was right there with him in the studio on the night of the incident. He was asked a bunch of questions too. And even though things started great, everything kind of went left as soon as the prosecutor started asking questions. All the defense was trying to accomplish with calling up Adrian to take the witness stand was to create an alibi for Melly. Adrian Davis testified about three key factors. First, Melly got into the red Mitsubishi, not the gray Jeep Compass. Second, Melly was home when the gang found out about the death of his two buddies, Sack and Juvie. And lastly, he was looking for his phone because it wasn't anywhere near him. When the defense attorney asked questions, all he had to do was say yes. However, the prosecutor lady showed us that he said different things when he was questioned by her a few years back. He acted as if he couldn't remember any of the things that he said back then. Have you ever answered that question differently? I don't think so. If I were to show you your statement from May 5th of 2022, would that help you in answering if you've ever said something different than what you just testified in court? Uh, yeah, probably. Okay, approaching with page 33 of the statement, counsel. 
Adrian told a bunch of things that simply aren't that common for most people. One example, he don't remember any of his phone numbers. He claimed that everyone from a group used each other's phones regularly, and more. Also, he claimed that he was intoxicated that day and that he couldn't remember a lot from that day, yet when the defense attorney asked him questions, he answered accurately and it seemed that he remembered everything quite vividly. The prosecutor was trying to make him look like he's lying. If he is lying, then the alleged alibi that Melly has goes down the tubes. People think that this was a desperation move and that it won't get the defense anywhere close to where they want to be. The general opinion doesn't swerve in Melly's favor. It's simple. Defense was desperate. This man, his homeboy, was their, quote, wild card. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Attorneys will let you know all that up front. Sometimes it's all you got left. So many of y'all downgraded the prosecution's performance, but the fact that the defense could only bring one witness on the stand tells you all you need to know if that guilty verdict comes. But we cannot say anything anything for certain. It's up to the jury to decide this one at the end of the day, what Melly's fate's gonna look like. Melly spoke up in the ending of his friend's testimony too. For the very first time in this trial, we also heard Melly speak on this. He was asked by the judge if he wanted to testify in his own defense, and you know what? Melly straight up said, I ain't testifying. What is your decision? I will not testify. You will not be testifying. So what's y'all's take on this Melly situation we've been watching for the last few weeks? Let us know down about it in the comments section below. Thanks so much for watching to the very end. If you like this video, be sure to like it, comment, subscribe to our channel, share it with a friend or two, and as always, remember to keep it real sweet.